firstly, thank you so much for having us here. Um, it's kind of fun, this, actually, because I, uh, on the bold assumption that, that you're mostly quants and risk professionals and analytics types of people, I am one of you. I actually went from the light side to the blockchain dark side. So it's fun to be back with my old crew. Uh, and let's see how these worlds, uh, worlds collide. So I'm going to move pretty fast because half an hour is not enough time for me to do what I usually want to do. So I'm going to try and squeeze it into half an hour. Actually, I'm going to try and squeeze it into 20, 25 minutes so you can ask me some questions. But if you have any burning questions as we go through, don't worry, just ask them. All right, so how are we going to do this? Oh, well, this isn't working, so that's a good start. Let's go with this. Okay. Yes, blockchain is a little bit of a comedy topic. Uh, so is ICOs. And uh, especially if you've been in it for a long time, uh, it, it's, it's kind of gotten a bit of an interesting flavor to it. Um, if we're talking about real grown-up institutions doing real grown-up things on this new technology, uh, we kind of have to move forward from this. Um, and you know, you know you've made it if Dilbert does a cartoon about you, so at least we got that far. So who am I? As I said, I'm one of you. I have a, a master's in financial engineering. I was at UBS Investment Bank, used to run the UBS Delta team. I was in the workout group, some of you I mentioned. Uh, I, I, I met you while I was doing that. I was uh, selling large blocks of, uh, of real estate assets to people like, like BlackRock. Um, I then was in my first startup, which was, uh, which was actually, you'll, you'll appreciate this, we're pricing the credit markets in real time by complex event processing of multiple ingestions of data to build issuer-specific credit curves in 10-second increments for the entire credit market. We went bust, um, and then, uh, then I landed at uh, UBS O'Connor, UBS's hedge fund uh, outfit, so I was head of quant, uh, ended up being CTO, which was a bit of a random outcome, um, and that's where I found blockchain, and then I was the CEO of R3's lab and research center. R3 is the single biggest financial services focused consortium, which is now building a blockchain. Some of you may have heard of it, so I ran a big part of that for a long time. So I kind of have quant chops, and now I have blockchain chops. So. With that, let's talk about blockchain. So in light of the previous panel, I think you're all aligned at this point. I actually, two, three years ago when I used this slide, it used to feel like I was a bit forcing it a bit. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think we're all on board. It's the fourth industrial revolution. These new technologies are coming. They're not just a fad. It's not just hype. It's going to be real, and it is often, going to, it is, is often real now. So good, we've set the tone. It's big things are happening, and I think the previous panel set that tone. Right. Now we start to get really specific. So the World Economic Forum, this, by the way, if you haven't read this piece, is one of the better pieces, even to this day. It's two, two years, two and a bit years old, about what it means to think about financial markets infrastructure and how blockchain can change it. Just go on it so you can find it, just Google it. It's a really nice piece of work. It's hundreds of pages. It's, it's it, a lot of really quality people are involved in it. And really, the whole point is, Blockchain is only one of a piece of the puzzle in the fourth industrial revolution. So I'm going to tell you out front, like I don't believe that blockchain is the answer to everything. That's just ridiculous. But blockchain plus AI plus interesting machine learning and quantitative methods, that's where interesting things are going to happen. But let me, let, me, let me kind of move on and really just focus in on the blockchain part. Now, the, the, there's one of the problems with this space is tribalism. It's always the case when you start a new technology, you get the people over here who think that de complete decentralization is the only answer, and you get the people over here, the Luddites, who don't want to change any centralized, you know, leave it completely centralized because they're making a boatload of cash, and why would they change the status quo? As always, the answer is somewhere in between. It's, it's not about a completely decentralized future. If you know anything about Bitcoin, um, it, you'll know why it came about. It's, it's remove the government and remove the intermediaries and make it as, 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 uh, 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 as anonymous as possible and so I don't have to pay taxes. Well, great, that's a crypto-anarchic libertarian ideal that has no place in regulated industry or in this room. So let's move on from that. The real answer is partial decentralization is really powerful for financial markets infrastructure. And it will categorically help individuals, corporations, and governments in the future state. Hopefully I'll convince you of that in the next 20 minutes or so. So let's kind of get that out of the way. I'm not a crypto anarchic libertarian. I'm a normal person trying to make my way in this crazy world. Now, DLT, what I'm not going to do is talk about the technology, because you know what? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. There's plenty of people, and some of you I'm sure are technologists and may even understand a lot of these concepts deeply. Uh, it doesn't matter. 
It's not about the technology, it's about what the technology would, can do, and I would contend that that's true of the other emerging technologies. It doesn't really, you can get into a debate all you like about different consensus mechanisms, and my blockchain is better than your blockchain. It doesn't matter, commercial outcomes matter, the bottom line matters, what it's gonna do for your company matters. So this is the only slide where I'm gonna talk about the technology. What does blockchain do at its core? Well, firstly, cryptocurrencies, digital assets, tokens, all operate on a blockchain structure. And for the purposes of this, blockchain and distributed ledger technology is the same thing up to a point. The truth is that all blockchains are distributed ledgers, but not all distributed ledgers are blockchains. If you want to talk about why that's the case, I'd be happy to do so afterwards. But let's, if you want to be really clear, not all, blo all blockchains are DLT, not all DLT is a blockchain. And ledgers have been around for hundreds of years. Nothing new about a ledger, we all know what that is, but distributed ledger technology is really only a few years old at the end of the day, since 2008. So that's kind of the hierarchy. Now over here, what is it that matters about what distributed ledgers do? None of these things I will note are new. Individually, they're not new. Cryptographic security is not new. The concept of non-repudiation and, and, and immutability is not new. Smart contracts, definitively not new. So Nick Sabo coined the term back in the mid-90s. Shared ledgers, the idea that we can all see the, right, the same thing at the same time or the right things at the right time, not new. And distributed consensus is also not new. What was amazing was that Satoshi Nakamoto in his famous or infamous 2008 paper, or he, she, or they, we don't really know, read that too, it's worth, really worth a read. It's seven pages long and it's mostly accessible to normal people. And it's very well written. He brought these together, just like Henry Ford didn't invent the car nor, ma mass, ma um, nor mass manufacture. He, he invented the uh, mass manufacture of the car. This all came together and now we have this amazing technology that can do all of these things. Great. This is why we shouldn't talk about the technology because it doesn't matter. Doesn't, it, we've got to figure out what can we do with this fancy new stuff that's coming online. All right, let's get this out of the way. Cryptocurrencies. Um, this was just from a couple of days ago. Uh, the top 10 cryptocurrencies that currently exist. Uh, Bitcoin is clearly by far the biggest, followed by Ethereum and, and Ripple. And then you've got stuff that is just generally less known. Ethereum and Ripple are generally known, I guess, in financial services. Obviously, everybody knows Bitcoin. Now, great, you all probably know the story. There was a big run up and this whole market was worth $800 billion at one point. Now it's only worth a couple of hundred billion. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter, because we're not here to talk about cryptocurrencies, right? The reason I do this is because it's kind of fun and just to get it out of the way. Okay, the ICO boom. Waste, for the most part, of everybody's time and energy. However, and this is really important because I'm going to come back to it, that's not to say that ICOs and tokenizations is not fundamentally useful to financial markets infrastructure. It is, but unfortunately this happened and more comedically, this happened. Sandcoin, an electronic option for high quality sand. I don't even know how that would work. One that actually you might get. I ha I've said this gag before and nobody got it. You'll probably get it. An investment token offering exposure to high growth ICOs. CDO squared, anyone? Hey, finally a laugh on that gag. I've been people are like, that's not a, that's not a gag. Uh, banana coin. Blockchain option for investing in production of organic bananas. But my favorite of all time, Wu-Tang coin. By far my favorite. What? This is how crazy it got. But now, this is where I, oh, oh and by the way, see that guy, that's me, um, who had eaten quite a lot more pies at the time. Um, and, uh, and the guy at the other end is Vitalik Buterin, who, in, who was with, uh, the guy who wrote the original Ethereum paper. And we did this April 1st gag, note the date, where we made up a coin. And, and this people were really interested in buying this thing. It was a made up thing. The point is, let's move on from that and start to get a little bit serious. Because we're all in highly regulated financial institutions, I suspect. ICOs have generally not been regulated, but the CFTC, the SEC, and every single regulator and central bank in the world is looking at this now. Make no mistake. And not just thinking about it, they've got teams working on it and have been for three years. So this is definitely being looked at and will be regulated and often in some jurisdictions is regulated. 
The ICO framework for capital raising actually makes sense. The idea that you can, in a way, crowdfund or find new ways of gathering assets and putting them into a tokenized form so that you can easily exchange them cryptographically securely with immutable properties, with the use of smart contracts, that is really, really powerful. And it's starting to seep into institutional tokens that are coming. Now, you will see, and I'm personally involved in some of these, uh, and there are others going on, by, by, I'm gonna go with Q1 of next year, Q2, there will be large regulated institutions like the likes of NASDAQ, CME, Fidelity, Goldman's, and others, who will be involved in utility coins coming out. And they will be real and useful, and they'll be regulated, and they'll be compliant, and they will be in financial markets infrastructure. The, this is the cutting edge as we speak, the sort of so-called so security token that we're all waiting for next. It's gonna happen. The biggest companies in the world are looking at this. Make no mistake, it's going to happen. So this is very exciting. And this, this over that side, that was PwC. Over this side, some really interesting, like this is what you would expect to see. Institutional quality thinking on how, what, the, what the, the, the taxonomy of tokens actually looks like. I'm not gonna spend time going through this. But it's, we're now getting into honest, real, interesting commercial mode, not banana coin. So this is the part that for years now, I've had the most number of cell phones come up at the end of talking through this slide where people go, aha, I think I might have understood it for the first time. Nothing to do with the tech and everything to do about what does this technology do? And suddenly some of you, I hope at least a few light bulbs go off in the next couple of minutes. Let's create a model, as we all would like to, of the world. A model of the world is effectively taking any government, any individual or any corporation, doesn't matter, two entities that wanna interact, they wanna transact in some way. Doesn't matter what that is, anyone from a simple bank deposit to the most complicated derivative, it's still a transaction. If in my little mental model, what we're doing is we're deciding to action something, the transaction. That's the part we're just gonna leave behind. That's still real people deciding to action something. And maybe it could be machines too. That counts as well. Then you have to communicate that you wanna do that thing. When you've communicated that you wanna do it, you then have to process on your side that you did it. And as a result, you will have a perception of what you just did. That is the simplest model you can have of transacting entities in the world, right? Now, before the internet, the communication layer was completely flat. Uh, so, uh, so I probably was not flat, was really inefficient, right? It, it was fax machines, it was smoke signals, it was carrier pigeons, it was, it, was, it was stuff that was really inefficient. And then came the internet and boom, we flattened out the communication layer. And that, I think you can all agree, has been a material effect on us uh, uh, as individuals, but also I in terms of the financial services market. In, perhaps in some ways, not as much as we thought. But we still process data on our own side, and we still therefore have a perception of that data based on that processing, and that's why we spend billions and billions of dollars a year in financial services reconciling. Um, did we do what you said you did? Billions, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, and that's also true, I would, I would contend with the world that, that we, quants, live in, like you've always got to check. There's all this checking that needs to go on. How did we come up with that model-based price? Why is every bank coming up with the same team of people doing the same modeling to get a slightly different price? Wait a minute. What if we had an ability to flatten the processing layer and therefore be crystal clear at all times that we were looking at the right thing, the same thing? cryptographically securely, immutably, no question that it's factually true and in real time. What if that was we, what we were able to do? And I contend to you that that internet layer is unidimensional, it's just data. It, and it will always just be data. And it will be more data, it will be faster data, be cleaner data, whatever. It's still just data, one dimension. Processing of information is multidimensional. The automatic processing of information is multidimensional in nature. And you can't think that AI and ML doesn't belong somewhere in there as well, right? So that's what's happening. That's the significant step forward.
it's not about web, I don't think it's web 3.0 personally, although that's used a lot. This is something else. This is something else than the internet. So that's what this is. So quick example, the internet was a 20th century technology. It was developed by the academics and military and then it kind of came out and was commercialized. It is fundamentally and always will only be a communication layer, that's it. It was the, effectively the democ democratization of data exchange. In the mass adoption was the Netscape moment that we all remember. Remember that first Netscape moment? Like, ooh, the little world with the N on it. And you were like, this is, what's this thing? And I've got, well, this is a website. And, and we all kind of got, this is how, this is gonna change the world. 1994-ish. And then retail, it was retail consumer led. More than, more than sort of commercially led at the time. And there was a bubble, no question. And the regulation's pretty light in that world. Now, DLT is different because it's a 21st century technology. It was 2008, so it is genuinely new. It's developed by the open source community. It wasn't com universities and, and military. It was the open source community. It came out of nowhere. It is a processing layer. It is orders of magnitude more interesting and powerful than a communication layer by definition. Democratization of value exchange and data ownership is what this is all about. So I, I think I caught as I walked in the door some debate about who owns data, I might be wrong. But think of it this way, and this has been an interesting shift actually in the last few months, like as soon as Facebook started to get a lot of grilling in front of governments around the world, we, I'll speak for myself, started thinking, oh wow, yeah, I totally gave them all my data and they're totally making billions off of it and I really don't want that anymore and I'm gonna delete my Facebook account or I promise I will at some point, but you know, right? We're all a little bit sickened by the realization that this communication layer ended up us giving all of our data away and other people making money out of it. Now that same thing is going on in financial markets. Is anyone from Bloomberg here? Sweet. So aren't you sick of sending them your data and then buying it back? That's what they do, make no mistake, market. Sorry if you're all here, I'm gonna just call you all out. IDC, market, Reuters, you're all taking data and sending it back and, and, and like having to make people pay for it. That's just the same as the Facebook crisis. When are they gonna end up in front of government? I don't know, that's a bit controversial. But you know, the point is, this is about who owns the data. And the only thing I'll say that's a drum G uh, point, because I don't want to talk about my company, is that we are building an actual network for actual investment banks where they're going to be able to own their data and, and be able to use it to mark their books and model-based pricing. It's all very relevant for what you want to do. If you want to talk about it, talk about it afterwards. But this isn't, this isn't just a, like a pretend thing. Credit Suisse, who's our anchor tenant and very public about it, and some of the other biggest banks in the world are working with us on this. So this is going to be implemented next year. So this isn't sort of random. But the big open question is, how is this gonna be adopted? In what format and how quickly? And is it gonna be consumer or retail led or is it gonna be commercially led? We don't know yet. Is there a bubble? Has there been a bubble? Will there be another bubble? I guess we'll only know in time. And how is the regulation gonna work? Well, we know. It's gonna be the core part of what makes it work, which is why we need the regulators to pay attention. So, I put this up because I have personally spoken to every one of these at some point. Trust me, they're all looking at it, right? This, and, and they've got teams and they're putting resources on it. I once did this uh, fun thing in front of the President's Council Advisors on uh, Science and Technology. So presidents are looking at it. Uh, if you wanna hear the funny story about the near earth objects, I'll talk to you afterwards, that was really quite funny. Now, I'll finish off with this. Let's talk about implementation in banks. There's a fallacy that you can be a fast follower in DLT, and this was the best example of why that's the case. And by the way, now, I used to say this three years ago in 2015 when I started this in this space, which is really sort of ish ground zero for enterprise financial services blockchain. This is bearing out now. If your institution isn't looking, and it's the same with AI and, and everything else, like if you're not looking at it and trying to establish how this might change your business model, and you might be able to cut costs and have new, way, new, new revenue opportunities. The time that you don't look at it is a gap. 
It's just, it's just a fact. And this is actually, I would say that finally now this is bearing out where some of the early movers like Credit Suisse, UBS, JP Morgan, um, among many others, are actually putting this stuff into production and getting value. And meanwhile, the laggards who are like, yeah, it's just a fad, are starting to be caught with their pants down because they don't know what to do. They don't have anyone who understands it. And you can't, this is a mindset shift. If we're talking about processing, multidimensional processing versus communication, it's really fascinating for those of us who can think in multiple dimensions, which I struggle to, but you get it. So it became very real in 2016 when Hyperledger Fabric and Corda and Quorum came out. Respectively, there's IBM led, R3 led, JP Morgan led, but really Enterprise Ethereum. And now an Enterprise Ethereum Lamas came along. So these slides I'm going to go through quickly, but the point is these are all involved. Some of them are startups and some of the biggest companies in the world, and they're putting material and significant resources into this. IBM, hundreds if not thousands of people. Microsoft, hundreds of people. Intel built their own ledger, Sawtooth Lake, and you've got some of the other ones around there. These are the big platforms. You may hear about them, you may know about them, but these are the things that matter. It's like saying Sybase and Oracle. Like, these are the ones that are gonna be the dominant platforms, and we'll see, you know, there's a bit of a Microsoft IBM type moment happening here. Um, these are the sort of names that are involved in Hyperledger, not small names. These are the sort of names that are involved in Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, some of the biggest companies in the world. These are the names that I met and built myself when I was at the R3, um, at R3 Building Lab and Research Center. Some of the biggest institutions in the world, probably I suspect most of you have picked something out that you either work in or have worked for, are putting material resources into this technology. So here's where I'm gonna end. So remember that thing I, t I told you about um, the President's Council of Advisors and Science Technology. I very, I've never tell this story, by the way, but you guys are the perfect audience to tell this. So I got one gag out of it and one interesting anecdote. So one, one, I was on this panel, and, and, and this is all on video, it's all online, and, and some sort of bearded, bespectacled, clearly sort of professorial individual, I think he was some professor at Yale, let's go with Yale, and he goes, could this have prevented this, the, the financial crisis? And I was, I was kind of like, oh no, I'm live on sort of, this is being recorded, I better make this good. And, and, I'm, and I'm the guy here, because it was a Bitcoin guy, and the, I'm the guy here who's representing the financial institutions, I better have a good answer for this. I can't remember what I said, it might have been a terrible answer. I've since had time to think about it. And now the answer is categorically yes, but why? So let's just do this analysis in our minds, right? What I'm suggesting is that you can have a multilateral communication with institutions where data is fundamentally permissioned. The right people seeing it at the right time. So people get concerned because, well, I put it all on a ledger and everybody can see it. Okay, that's the old version of the ledger. The new version of the ledger, because trust me, JP Morgan and, and big hedge funds will not go on a distributed ledger if anyone gets to see their data. And this is not gonna happen. So trust me, the technology's gotten to the point where you can control who sees it and who doesn't. Some of the products we're building, we won't even be allowed to see the data. We can obfuscate that with zero knowledge proofs and multi-party computation and, and lots of cool new stuff like that. So if you can put that stuff and can put it on a couple of networks that are linked up and you have instant access for regulators, for risk managers, in a permissioned and control way on what's going on in the system, because the system's built on a blockchain, therefore we have access to that data and it's not in the silos that started all this mess back in 2008 in the first place. I worked at UBS. We had three portfolios with the same risk that lost us $60 billion in the one company, right? So we could have solved that with this. We could have solved it across the whole industry. Now there's a lot, I'm not saying you can put this in place tomorrow, but categorically, we could have a better risk management profile across within institutions and across institutions and across different marketplaces that we could never have before. You just can't in the current construct. The, the data is siloed, the business process are fundamentally siloed. And as I always like to say, value will be found at the intersection of previously walled gardens. That's what's at stake. We get to bring the walled gardens down and join them together. So I think the answer to this is yes. We're too far at this point to know exactly how that's gonna happen, but what, think about it. Like that's what's, that's what's coming next. And so I think that's probably it. I can talk about other stuff, but you've probably had enough. So 
by all means, please get in touch. But we should have questions if you are brave. Come on, Ron. Isn't there part of the problem is uh, taxonomy in terms yeah. of the data and people not really agreeing on uh, what really needs to be in every single transaction and until you get a standardization, you're, it's going to be difficult for somebody to make a huge investment in this area. Thank you for that question. So, so yes, I would contend blockchain aside that we have a massive ontology problem in this marketplace, right? We've got to faff around trying to figure out if your representation of this is the same as my representation of this. There's some standardization, but it doesn't work across different marketplaces, which is why Bloomberg's made a mint being that big machine that is a big ont ontological engine that takes in all the data and spits it out with one venue, which is the terminal. It's why they make 350,000 times $2,000 a month. It's a nice check with a really healthy margin. They figured it out. What this allows is uh, the ability to have ontological layers. And I, basically, I'm agreeing with you that you need to get some level of ontology, some, some semantics in place so that everybody's talking the same language. What's really interesting and what we've found out is that you don't need to have it in on, on the blockchain. That was always the big concern, that you'd have to have all of this financial services infrastructure, such as a semantic and ontology layer, ontological layer, in the blockchain. Never going to happen. It's just never going to be that powerful. It's too complicated. It's too specific to our marketplace, which is why we have to have companies like DrumG and many others. There are others who are doing this who are actually figuring out what that looks like. You're right, there's a limitation in how quickly that can go across networks. There's just a, it's just only so fast we'll go. But what's exciting is we're talking about interoperability layers that should solve that problem. The good news is with AI and ML and sort of sophisticated data techniques, combining different ontologies gets easier and easier with time. So I totally agree with you. It is a barrier as security and scalability and other things are. But it is being thought of, like one example is Digital Asset, which, which is the one that many people know, their, their DAML, Digital Asset Markup Language, is actually trying to sort of address that in some ways. Um, Axoni are doing Axcore, or Axlang, I should say. So, so people are looking at that. They've, we've identified that's a, that's a barrier. Um, but what's exciting is when we solve it, all the stuff we can't do now, we're going to get to do. So thank you for that question. It was a really good one, actually. Uh, isn't custody and security the number one issue that's preventing the actual crypto side of the market from growing? 100%, yes. So uh, what's interesting is if, you know, I mentioned some big names that, that I suspect will be involved one way or another in, in legitimately regulated utility and security tokens in the matter of months. None of them will do this unless they have a custody solution that's going to pass muster with InfoSec and, and, and all these sorts of people. And what's exciting is that that's now happening. So you're, you're seeing, Trustology is a great example, um, create solutions for this that are also not bound by, and again, I hope nobody from Boney Mellon's here, but Boney Mellon's my, I always go to that as the sort of cust the, lag the laggard custodian. Um, you know, I, look, I, they're, they're one of our clients, so I shouldn't muck about with them. But you know, they're, they're the classic example. All the big custodians won't want to change. Why would you? It's a nice vig that you're getting on we're custodying these assets. But the, the, the future's starting to move along. State Street get the joke. They've been looking at this from the very beginning. Um, but you're right, that still has to be solved. It's kind of the same answer as this. It's like, yes, it's recognized. Smart people are putting money and resources into it. And at some point, we're going to get the ability for us uh, and institutional asset managers and hedge funds working with their custodians and PBs to have a very real-time solution for ensuring that that token, that digital asset, is absolutely secure. And from a regulatory perspective, a security perspective, all of that pretty sound. In, in, one, in some ways, the, the, the cloud adoption thing is a little bit of a, of a precursor to what we're going through. Like finally, and I'm sure as quants, you want to use the cloud for the stuff you want to do, right? I mean, I remember I was only at UBS in 2015. Getting anything on the cloud was like pulling teeth. That's changing, right? You know, Credit Suisse did a massive deal with Azure to put a ton of stuff on, 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 on the cloud. That needed, that, that was, a, and I would argue that was irrational three years ago to not do it because the technology hasn't improved. We'll have to go through some of that to get there. Uh, 
and I, it would be wrong to, to say that the custody problem is definitively solved, but now we're seeing that that the, the signs that it will be and the technology's there, but you're absolutely right. It, 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 that's part of the solution for, why would Fidelity set up Fidelity Digital Assets? They just did it. Uh, it you know, there's 100 people allegedly in this team because they think this is gonna be figured out, right? Any more? Well, in that case, thank you very much for your time.